All right, third graders, are you ready for our next chapter in our book, Where the Mountain Meets the Moon? Here we go, chapter 12. The goldfish man turned around and smiled questioningly at Ma and Ba, who could do nothing but continue to stare. He was slender and small, which was perhaps why it was easy to mistake his footprints for Min Lee's. The dragging lines Ma had thought were from Min Lee's walking stick led to his cart, and the bowls of goldfish caught the shifting beam from the sun, slivering into flashing sparkles of light. The goldfish man's eyes also flashed as he looked at Ma and Ba and their dust-covered clothes and haggard, tired faces. Can I help you? He asked them. We, are looking, we were looking for our daughter, Ba stammered. We are from the village of Fruitless Mountain. You sold her a goldfish and then, Ma sputtered, and then she ran away to change our fortune. I see, the goldfish man said. And again, he looked at them at Ma's tight, angry frown and Ba's careworn, worried face. And you are going after her to stop her? Of course, Ba said. We need to bring her home. Yes, Ma said. She is acting crazy. Who knows what could happen to her? She could succeed, the goldfish man said steadily. She could find a way to change your fortune. She's trying to find a never-ending mountain, Ma said. Ask questions to the old man of the moon. There is no way for her to succeed. Yes, Ba said. It's impossible. The goldfish man looked at a third time at Ma and Ba, and this time they felt it. Under his gaze, Ma and Ba suddenly felt like freshly peeled oranges, and their words fell away with, from them. Inexplicably, they felt ashamed. Let me tell you a story, the goldfish man said. The story of the goldfish man. My grandmother, Lao Lao, was a famous fortune teller. People from far away villages would line up at our home asking for lucky dates for weddings and predictions for their children. If she was ever wrong, we never heard of it. But a week before my 19th birthday, we heard her moaning in her room. When we rushed to her, we found her sitting on the floor with her fortune-telling sticks spread around her. To my surprise, as soon as I entered the room, her piercing eyes fixed upon me. You, she said, you will die next week on your birthday. It was as if she had exploded a firecracker in the room. My parents and aunts and cousins burst into exclamations and wails. It is true, it is true, my grandmother insisted. I have checked and rechecked over and over again, and the sticks always say the same. Next week on his 19th birthday, he will die. That is his fortune. I could not believe it. How could this be? But my belief in my grandmother was unshakable. If she said so, it must be true. I stood staring at my family. I stood staring as my family created a storm around me. Finally, I said with a mouth as dry as sand, Lao Lao, isn't there anything I can do? There is only one thing you can do, she said, but it is doubtful it will work. I'll do it, I said. First, Lao Lao said, we must get a bottle of the finest wine and a, make a box of sweets. So Lao Lao went to the rich magistrate of the town and persuaded him to give her a bottle of his best wine. My mother and aunts hurried to the kitchen and prepared cakes, cookies, and sweetmeats with more care than ever before. Before the aromas of the delicacies were captured in our most ornate box, they floated in the air, causing all the neighborhood animals to whine at our door. And then Lao Lao went to her room and began to read her fortune sticks. When she came out, she gave me up the box of sweets and bottle of wine and sat me down. Listen to me carefully, she said. You must do exactly as I say. Tomorrow morning, you must walk north of the village. Do not stop until the moon begins to appear in the sky. When it does, you will see a mountain before you. And at the foot of the mountain, you will see an old man reading a book. Open the box of sweets and bottle of wine and set them by him. But do not say a word unless he speaks to you first. This is the only chance we have to change your fortune. So the next morning, I followed her instructions and it was as she'd said. 
I walked all day, and when the sun finally withdrew from the sky, there was a vast mountain in front of me whose tip seemed to touch the moon. Sitting cross-legged at the bottom was an old man reading a giant book. The light from the moon seemed to make him glow silver. I opened the bottle of wine and box of sweets and quietly laid them next to him. Then I sat and waited. The old man didn't notice me and continued to read. My mouth watered as the smell of the sweets drifted in the air, but I didn't move. And even though the old man was engrossed in his book, he must have smelled them as well, because without lifting his eyes from the page, he began to eat. It was only when the bottle of wine was empty and he was eating the last cake that the old man lifted his head. He seemed surprised to see a half-eaten cake in his hand. I've been eating someone else's food, he said to himself. He looked up and saw me sitting nearby. You boy, was this your food? Yes, I said, and I came closer as he beckoned. Well, he said to me, what are you doing here? I told the old man my story while he rubbed his beard. When I finished, he said nothing, but began to turn the pages in the, his book. Finally, he nodded. Yes, it's true, the old man said. You are to live only 19 years. And he turned the book toward me, and in the moonlight, I read my name on the page. Next to my name was the number 19. Please, I couldn't help asking, isn't there any way to change it? Change it? The old man asked, surprised at the thought. Change the book of fortune? Yes, I nodded. Well, the old man said, stroking his beard, I am indebted to you for having eaten your food. He took a paintbrush from his robe and studied the page. Hmm, he said to himself, maybe if, no, perhaps, ah, yes, this is how it can be done. With a simple flick of from his brush, he changed the 19 to 99. Good, he said to me. You now have many more years of life. Live them well. Then he closed his book, stood up, and began to walk up the mountain, leaving me staring behind him. I sat there until he disappeared from sight and then turned around and went home. The next week on my birthday, there was a terrible typhoon. The wind howled as it never had before, and a tree fell right on top of the roof of our house and crashed into my room, narrowly missing me. If it had fallen just a bit more to one side, I would have been easily killed. But as I climbed out of the ruins of my room, I saw my grandmother's eyes staring into mine. Silently, she nodded. She did not need words to tell me what had happened. I knew my fortune had been changed. But for Min Lee to try this, to do this is different, Ba started. She's trying to find never ending mountain. Ask a question. She's just a small girl. Perhaps, the goldfish man said, you need to trust her. But, Ma said, but what she wants is impossible. Impossible, the goldfish man said. Don't you see? Even fates written in the book of fortune can be changed. How can anything be impossible? Ma and Ba could find no words. His eyes and the hundreds of eyes of the goldfish behind him seemed to silently scold them. As they looked at the ground, the goldfish man shifted back his bag and turned toward his cart. Here, a gift, the goldfish man said, placing a bowl into Ba's shaking hands. The fish, the pale silver color of the moon, circled in the bowl. Perhaps if you cannot trust that your daughter will find never-ending mountain, you should trust that she will return home to you, because that is not impossible. So whether Min Lee brings it to you or not, I wish you good fortune. And with a bow, the goldfish man walked away. His bowls of goldfish cast pieces of rainbow in the air, making him sparkle in the sun. Ma and Ba stood and watched him until he looked like a twinkling star in the distance.